Hi folks, and welcome to chapter nine on microbial growth. In this lecture, we are going to cover a range of topics related to the growth of microbes, including the mechanisms by which they grow, the environmental requirements that they need in order to grow. We'll also talk about different types of growth media that are used in the laboratory to cultivate microbes. And then lastly, we'll talk about how we measure microbial growth in the lab. When we talk about microbial growth, what we're referring to is not the growth of the microbes to be larger in size, but the growth to be larger in number. Microscopic organisms always stay microscopic, unless of course we're talking about helminths, which are an exception, but they do grow larger in number. As you can see in this animation right here, we can start with a small number of microbes and over a very short period of time, they can continually divide and clone themselves to create a much larger number. And this is what we're talking about when we refer to microbial growth. Now what we see in this animation is a process called binary fission, which we've mentioned before as the main process by which bacteria divide. Binary fission literally means splitting in two. Binary means two, fission means to split. So this is an asexual mode of reproduction that is exhibited by bacteria and some types of protozoa. It's a very simple and straightforward process compared to division that takes place in many eukaryotes. And all that happens is DNA is replicated. And once there are two copies of DNA in the same bacterial cell, a septum is created, which pinches the cell membrane off and eventually the cell completely separates into two new cells that are identical to the original parent cell. We can see in this microscopy image a bacillus that is in the process of undergoing division, and you can see the septum formation happening in the middle of what will be the two new cells. Another form of microbial division is a phenomenon called budding. Budding is also a type of asexual reproduction. But this type of reproduction takes place mainly not in bacteria, by, but rather by yeast. There are some bacteria that perform budding, but yeast, the eukaryotic single-celled fungi, are the main organisms that perform this type of reproduction. What you can see happening here, and what we'll talk about later when we discuss yeast in more detail, is yeast cells with buds that are forming and emerging from their surface and eventually those buds break off and become new independent cells. So now that we've taken an overview of some of the different ways that microscopic organisms divide, we are going to take a look one by one at five of the categories of growth requirements that all microscopic organisms need. Those growth requirements have to do with environmental temperature, environmental pH, environmental osmotic pressure, environmental oxygen, and the availability of nutrients to the microbes. So we'll start off by discussing temperature. Every species of microbe has a specific temperature range within it, uh, which it grows well, and that range usually spans about 30 degrees Celsius from the minimum growth temperature all the way up to the maximum growth temperature. For example, Escherichia coli, or E. coli, has a minimum growth temperature of 4 degrees Celsius, after which point no growth is observed, and a maximum growth temperature all the way up to 45 degrees Celsius, after which point growth rapidly decreases as the, uh, the temperature gets too high for the cell's enzymes to function. But the optimal growth temperature for E. coli sits at 37 degrees Celsius, you can see the peak of that temperature right about here. And um, this 37 degrees Celsius, as we've mentioned before, is human body temperature. And it is pretty typical to find uh, bacteria that have a optimal growth temperature that corresponds to a host organism that they live inside. So E. coli is a bacterium that lives in the intestines and therefore its optimal growth temperature makes sense that it's 37 degrees Celsius human body temperature. Now 
not every bacterium has the same growth temperature range here. So E. coli would be considered something called a mesophile. A mesophile is a bacterium that has an optimal growth temperature range that is somewhere in the range of human body temperature here. But there are also types of bacteria that grow well at much higher temperatures as well as much lower temperatures. For example, psychrophiles are organisms that grow at much lower temperatures, and these organisms tend to be the ones that are involved in, for example, food spoilage as it occurs in your refrigerator. If you ever pull old food out of your refrigerator and you find that it has microbial growth in it and it smells bad and it's, um, it, it's clearly spoiled, psychrophiles, which grow well at low temperatures, are probably responsible. Thermophiles, on the other hand, tend to grow at much higher temperatures, and there is actually another category above thermophiles, which is considered the hyperthermophiles. Hyperthermophiles, as you can see, have an optimal growth uh, temperature because this is degrees Celsius that is close to 100 degrees Celsius, which is literally the point at which water boils. So these bacteria are ones that you might find, for example, um, deep underwater near a hydrothermal vent that is uh, fed by geothermal energy or in a hot spring or a geyser. Um, they're not ones that you would find in the human body by any means. And then um, moving on to the growth requirement of pH, pH is very similar in that each species has a optimal pH, and we can categorize and group microbes based upon what range their optimal pH falls into. If their optimal pH is somewhere around 7 um, or in the vicinity, then we call these neutrophiles because 7 is neutral pH. If their pH is lower um, and it has an acidic uh, optimal pH, then we call these acidophiles. And if their pH optimally is higher, then we call these alkalophiles because they prefer an alkaline pH. Now, we almost never find um, organisms that prefer a basic pH in the human body. We find neutrophiles and acidophiles. For example, we might find neutrophiles in your saliva, which has a pH just below 7. We might find acidophiles uh, in the stomach and the gut, which has a very low pH, or for example, in the vaginal canal, which also has a low pH. Now, while it's pretty easy to wrap our heads around temperature and pH as growth requirements for microbes, the third growth requirement pertains to osmotic pressure, which requires a little bit more elaboration to understand. Osmosis, you may remember from our prerequisite course, is the movement of water to areas of high solute concentration with the goal of achieving equal distribution of dissolved particles. For example, in this animation right here, we have a membrane that is separating two compartments, and on the left-hand compartment, initially there's a high concentration of water molecules and a relatively lower concentration of solutes. On the right side, there is a low concentration of water, or rather an absence of water, and the high concentration of solutes, shown by the red dots here, actually draws the water across the membrane because there's a natural tendency for particles to diffuse and spread themselves out in order to achieve equal concentration over all available areas. Osmotic pressure can lead to several, several responses in living cells. Depending upon the concentration of the solutes, outside of the cell relative to the inside of the cell. An isotonic solution is one in which there is an equal concentration of dissolved particles inside of the cell compared to outside of the cell. And under this circumstance, there is no net movement of water because osmosis does not dictate that water must be drawn in one direction or the other because everything is already in equilibrium. Hypotonic solutions, however, describe an extracellular solution where there is a lower concentration of solutes or dissolved particles 
externally compared to inside of the cell. This means that water has the tendency to move into the cell via osmosis because inside of the cell is where the higher concentration of dissolved particles is localized. Hypertonic solutions are the opposite. This describes a solution where there is a higher concentration of dissolved particles external to the cell relative to the inside. As a result, there's a tendency for water to be drawn out of the cell and move in the direction where there is the higher concentration of solutes. And as we can see in these examples, which show a drawing of a red blood cell, notably not a microbe, but a human red blood cell, there are certain physical responses that cells experience after this net movement of water takes place. Hypertonic solutions, because they draw water out of the cell, can have a shriveling effect on the cell. And this shriveling is called plasmolysis. Plasmolysis can lead to the death of a cell through the ultimate loss of water. In this animation right here, we can see the plasmolysis of a, a plant cell inside of the cell wall when exposed to a hypertonic solution. These divisions here represent the cell walls of the plant, and you can see how the membrane of the cell will shrivel up and shrink within the boundaries of the cell wall in response to a hypertonic solution that is drawing all of the water out of the cell. Now the opposite takes place in a hypotonic solution. A hypotonic solution will result in the bursting or lysis of cells and thus can lead to their death as well. Because hypotonic solutions push water into cells, this will cause the membrane of the cell to swell, and if there is no cell wall to prevent them from bursting, they will lyse. Here we see human red blood cells under the microscope placed in distilled water, which is purified water that does not contain any dissolved particles. And as you can see, after a short period of time, water is pushed into the cell and the cell bursts. Now notably, types of cells that have cell walls are protected from this effect. Prokaryotes and fungi all have cell walls, and therefore hypotonic solutions do not pose as great of a threat to them as hypertonic solutions do, because the strength of the cell wall will prevent the cell membrane to expand from expanding to such a degree that the cell will burst. Nonetheless, despite this protective effect of the cell wall, the ideal solution for most species of microbes is an isotonic one. Isotonic solutions wherein there is no net movement of water via osmosis represents the proper osmotic pressure for most but not all species of microbes. This brings us to our very first checkpoint. Curing meat, you may know, by adding large amounts of salt used to be a common method of preserving it before refrigeration technology was available. Knowing what you know about osmotic pressure, explain to me why salting meat inhibits its spoiling as a result of microbial growth. So at this point, we have talked about temperature, we've talked about pH, we've talked about osmotic pressure, and now we're going to move on to discussing oxygen requirements. Because unlike animals, not all microscopic organisms require the same amount of oxygen, and in fact, some require no oxygen at all. There are actually five different categories of microscopic organisms that we can identify based upon their unique requirements with regard to oxygen. The first category is called obligate aerobes, sometimes just referred to as aerobes. What obligate aerobes means is that they are obligated to have oxygen in order to survive. These types of microbes 
are similar to humans in that they require oxygen to live. Facultative anaerobes are organisms that will use oxygen when present, but they can survive without it. Obligate anaerobes are organisms that the opposite of obligate aerobes are actually harmed by oxygen. They require the absence of oxygen in order to live. Aerotolerant anaerobes are microbes that cannot use oxygen, but they tolerate it when it is present. And then lastly, microaerophiles require a small amount of oxygen that is lower than what is present in the atmosphere at large, usually somewhere between 1% and 10%, whereas the atmosphere has a 21% concentration of oxygen. So these are the five categories of different oxygen requirements, and we're going to spend a little bit more time expanding specifically on the obligate anaerobes category. Because while it may make sense to us that organisms require oxygen to live, and we may even understand how processes like anaerobic respiration and fermentation lead to the ability of organisms to survive without oxygen, we still don't have our minds around how organisms can be harmed by oxygen or how oxygen can be toxic. Well, it turns out that oxygen's toxic forms are present in all living organisms. When living organisms go about their metabolism and are exposed to oxygen, inevitably toxic and unstable forms of oxygen called free radicals are formed. The difference between obligate anaerobes and other types of organisms that can tolerate the presence of oxygen is that obligate anaerobes lack special enzymes that other organisms have evolved to deal with and clean up the toxic forms of oxygen. Here on the screen, what you can see is superoxide anion, which you can see is a normal oxygen gas particle with an extra negative charge. What this negative charge indicates is that there are additional highly unstable and highly reactive electrons that are present on this oxygen molecule. These unstable electrons can cause it to react with and harm various biochemical mechanisms in the cell. And so organisms need to have a way to get rid of superoxide anions, which again, are produced naturally and inevitably through a normal part of the organism's metabolism. Luckily, there are enzymes that are able to do this inside of the majority of living organisms. What one of these enzymes does, and the name of this enzyme is called superoxide dismutase, is takes two of these superoxide anions and combines them with two hydrogen ions. The result of this chemical reaction is the production of a harmless, stable form of oxygen, as well as hydrogen peroxide. The trouble with that, however, is that hydrogen peroxide is also still toxic. And so a further step is needed, this one catalyzed by an enzyme named catalase, which transforms the hydrogen peroxide into harmless molecules of water and more harmless stable oxygen. The thing about obligate anaerobes is that they do not make these enzymes. They do not possess superoxide dismutase and they do not possess catalase. This means that they have no way to clean up and get rid of these toxic forms of oxygen. Other organisms, have these enzymes and are able to survive in the presence of oxygen as a result. Now in the laboratory, there are special types of media that we can use to grow organisms and observe their differential oxygen requirements. One of these that we'll be using in one of our labs this semester is called thioglycolate media. And when organisms are grown in thioglycolate media, you can expect to see them grow in a particular area of the tube based upon their oxygen requirement. Because thioglycolate media is a liquid media that contains 
a low percentage of agar, which allows microbes to circulate in the media freely, and it also contains ingredients that limit the amount of dissolved oxygen. So the microbes will be circulating throughout the tube, but they will only grow and pro proliferate in the part of the tube where the oxygen uh, is optimal for their specific requir requirements. Oxygen should only be available near the top of the tube where the liquid interfaces with the air. So this means that obligate aerobes, the ones that require oxygen for growth, will localize at the top of the tube where the oxygen is available. Facultative anaerobes can live without oxygen, but they use oxygen when it is present for aerobic cellular respiration. Thus, they grow more efficiently at the top of the tube, but they still will grow throughout. Obligate anaerobes, because they require an absence of oxygen, they will grow towards the bottom of the tube, where the oxygen is absent. Aerotolerant anaerobes are not harmed by oxygen, but they are also not benefited by oxygen. And so this means that they are expected to grow evenly throughout the tube and be completely unaffected by the amount of dissolved oxygen at the top versus the bottom. Lastly, microaerophiles usually require somewhere between 1% and 10% oxygen. So they'll usually grow somewhere towards the top of the tube, but not at the very top like the obligate aerobes, because that percentage of oxygen would be too high for them. So next we have a checkpoint that is going to require you to think back to our previous chapter's lecture on microbial metabolism. So this right here that you see on the plate is a species called Streptomyces celicolor, and this species is an obligate anaerobe that resides in the soil. Because oxygen is toxic to it, it cannot perform aerobic cellular respiration. So tell me, how might this species generate energy instead? And how does this metabolic process that you've named differ from aerobic cellular respiration? Next, we have one more checkpoint where we're looking at two tubes of thioglycolate media. Based upon the growth pattern that you see in the tube, tell me, what class of oxygen requirements would letter A represent and letter B? And when you're looking at these tubes, in letter A, there is a little bit of residue at the bottom, but this is the settling of dead cells out of the culture. What you want to pay attention to is the stripe of growth that you can see right here in tube A. Now the last growth requirement that we need to talk about is the nutritional requirements of microbes. There is a suite of elements that microbes must have available to them in order to grow. And top of that list is carbon. Carbon, as we've mentioned before, is the scaffold for all organic molecules, including carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids like DNA and RNA. Also important is nitrogen. Nitrogen is involved in protein synthesis. That is also true of sulfur, another elemental requirement. Phosphorus is required for making ATP, which as we've mentioned, has phosphate groups present in it, as well as in the making of DNA and RNA. Trace elements of different um, metallic ions are also required, and these serve as cofactors for enzymes. Some common ones include iron, copper, and zinc. So that completes our discussion of the five microbial growth requirements. And now we're going to move on to talking about how we can grow and raise microbes in a laboratory setting using material called culture media. Culture media is defined as the material upon, with, uh, upon or within which microbes grow. It contains a defined amount of nutrients that are needed for microbial metabolism. And culture media must be sterile when you set off to use it, meaning that it must contain no living microbes. If it is already contaminated with existing microbes, then this will inhibit your ability to obtain a pure culture of the organism that you are working with.
In just a moment, we'll talk about different approaches that are taken in the laboratory to sterilize different types of media. But before we talk about that, we're going to describe the different types of liquid or solid media that are used in the lab. Here in this image, you can see four different types of common media, including the agar plate, the agar deep tube, the broth tube, and the agar slant. Three out of four of these are solid media, and those are the agar plate, the agar deep, and the agar slant. The agar broth, or pardon me, just the broth, is a liquid type of media. The way that the other three types of media are made solid is through the addition of an agent called agar, which is a complex carbohydrate similar to gelatin that is used as a thickening agent. The way that agar works is very similar to gelatin in terms of adding it to a liquid solution, heating it up, and as you cool it down, it becomes solid. Solid media, like the ones that we saw on the previous slide, especially the agar plate, is useful for detecting contamination in samples of microbes. Because when you have a large surface area, such as the one found on the agar plate, you can spread quantities of microbes out and observe their different cultural characteristics, which allows you to determine if you have a pure culture. As we said, media needs to be sterile when you set off to work with it and there are different techniques by which sterilization can be achieved. Perhaps the most common one is autoclaving. You can think about an autoclave as being like a laboratory pressure cooker. It heats up to 121 degrees Celsius and a pressure of 15 pounds per square inch for 30 minutes, which essentially kills everything that could possibly be growing inside of whatever you put in there. After we work with samples in the lab, they are always transferred to an autoclave and cooked at this temperature and this pressure for 30 minutes in order to kill them. An alternative to the autoclave is dry heat. Dry heat requires heating up a sample to 160 to 170 degrees Celsius for two to four hours. This type of sterilization is best for lab glassware and it's not good for liquids. And you can imagine why is because liquids boil at around 100 degrees Celsius. So this requires a heat that is much higher than the normal boiling temperature of water. Filtration is another sterilization technique. And filtration is typically used for growth media that cannot be heated. For example, there are certain types of growth media that contain enriching ingredients like red blood cells. And when you heat that media up, it would destroy the red blood cells. So not being able to heat that media, an alternative is to filter it. Using filters with tiny microscopic pores in them, you can filter out any bacteria, protozoa, or viral contaminants. The goal of a growth media is to allow microbes to proliferate on its surface. And so it contains all of the nutrients and ingredients that are needed for microbial metabolism. But sometimes media also contains special additional ingredients that give it a particular purpose. There are two types of media that serve distinct purposes in the lab, and those are selective and differential media. Selective media are growth media that are designed to selectively cultivate one type of bacteria and suppress all of the others. Differential media, on the other hand, are designed to distinguish between different types of bacteria growing on the same plate. And so the utility of both of these types of media in the lab is they can allow you to identify specific species of bacteria by giving you, for example, a color change or by suppressing the growth of other types of microbes and proving that there is a specific type of microbe in a sample. Let's look at some examples. An example of a type of selective media is bismuth sulfite agar. This is a agar media that contains the additional ingredient of bismuth sulfite. 
its utility in the clinic is that only Salmonella typhi can grow in the presence of bismuth sulfite. Salmonella typhi is the agent that causes the disease typhoid fever. And so this type of plate can be used to isolate and identify Salmonella typhi from fecal matter samples. If there is a species found growing on the plate after a fecal sample is spread on it, you know that it's Salmonella typhi because the bismuth sulfite has suppressed other types of microbes. An example of differential media is blood agar. Blood agar allows for the growth of species um, that are able to destroy red blood cells, and their identification is given by a clear halo around the outside of the growth, as you can see in this image right here. So these species can be identified by plating them on blood agar and differentiated between species that cannot destroy red blood cells. Both species that can and cannot destroy red blood cells will grow on this plate, but only ones that can consume red blood cells will present with a halo around the outside of the growth. So in this sense, blood agar is a differential media that allows you to differentiate between two different groups of bacteria. Selective and differential, however, are not mutually exclusive categories because there are growth media out there that are both differential and selective. One of these is the mannitol salt agar plate. This is abbreviated as the MSA plate, and the ingredients that are added to this plate to create the differential and selective capabilities are, first of all, salt. The high salt concentration makes this plate selective, such that only special salt-tolerant genera of bacteria, such as Staphylococcus, can grow on its surface. However, within the genus Staphylococcus, there are multiple different types of species that sometimes need to be distinguished from each other. For example, here on this plate, we can see two different species of Staphylococcus, Staphylococcus epidermidis and Staphylococcus aureus. The plate has selectively allowed both of them to grow, but the differential capacity of the plate comes from the ingredients mannitol and phenol red. Phenol red is a pH indicator that is red at neutral pHs, but as the pH becomes acidic, it turns yellow in color. Mannitol is found in this agar media, and if a species of bacteria can take up that mannitol and perform fermentation to release acid as a byproduct, then the area around the growth will drop in pH and turn yellow in color. This is a unique feature of Staphylococcus aureus, not Staphylococcus epidermidis. As we can see, both have been selected for growth on this plate, but we can differentiate between the two by the yellow halo around Staphylococcus aureus. Clinically, this is useful because Staphylococcus aureus is the more virulent and pathogenic of the two species and the cause of the staph infection, whereas Staphylococcus epidermidis is a mostly non-pathogenic normal member of the skin microbiome. In this checkpoint, we're going to take a look at a type of media that you haven't yet seen called EMB agar. EMB agar is named for its contents of eosin and methylene blue. Eosin is an ingredient that is toxic to gram-positive bacteria. Methylene blue, on the other hand, will turn black in color in the presence of gram-negative bacterial species that produce lactic acid. So, based on that information, is EMB agar differential, selective, or both? And how so? Explain. Now, to finish off our discussion of differential and selective media, I have included two pictures here um, of, first of all, an EMB agar plate the one that was in the last checkpoint question, and here a mannitol salt agar plate. Here we see E. coli on the EMB agar plate, which has given off this brilliant metallic green color. And here we see Staphylococcus aureus, 
grown uh, in the shape of a jack-o'-lantern on the MSA plate, so it has turned the uh, jack-o'-lantern face yellow in color. Lastly, we're going to take a look at fastidious microbes. Fastidious microbes are ones that are categorized as having particularly picky and difficult to nail down nutritional requirements. There are many microbes for which we don't fully understand the um, range of nutritional requirements that we need to provide them with when growing them in a lab. And so we often need to provide fastidious microbes with some sort of enriched media that contains a highly nutrient-rich ingredient, such as, for example, sheep's blood on the blood agar plate. Neisseria gonorrhoeae is one of those species. This is the species that causes the venereal disease gonorrhea, and it requires blood or hemoglobin to grow, as well as special amino acids and special vitamins. In the final part of this lecture, we are going to take a look at the speed of microbial growth and how we measure their growth in the lab. We refer to the pace at which microbes grow as their generation time or their doubling time. It's called doubling time because remember, when microbes grow or when bacteria grow, they undergo binary fission. And with each round of binary fission, the number of microbes is doubled. If we start with a single microbe at the end of one doubling time or one generation time, the number is two. Then each of those two microbes will proceed through a second generation and each of them will double as well. The average amount of doubling time typically ranges between 20 minutes and 24 hours, depending upon the species of microbe that you are looking at. Uh, e. coli is one of the faster doubling time microbes. Its doubling time is on the order of 20 minutes. But these are for some of the more typical microbes that we encounter in our everyday lives. There are also known species of microbes that take much, much longer to double. For example, there are species of bacteria at the bottom of the ocean that fossil evidence indicates only reproduce once every 10,000 years. So the 20 minutes to 24 hours is a rough guideline that mostly applies to microbes that we encounter in our everyday lives. Now I'm going to give you a little math puzzle here. If an infection starts with a single bacterium that undergoes binary fission once every hour, so its generation time is one hour, how many bacteria will be in that sample after six hours have passed? And I'll give you a hint. The way to solve this problem is not to multiply one times six. It's a little bit more complex than that. So think about it for a second and give me a number. The goal of that checkpoint and that little number puzzle is to demonstrate to you that bacterial growth takes place at an exponential rate, meaning that the bacteria do not increase in a steady straight line, rather they increase at an increasing rate. A species like E. coli that doubles every 20 minutes could theoretically go from a single cell all the way up to 4.7 times 10 to the 21 cells in a single day's time period under perfectly optimal conditions. And that's because which, with every generation time, the amount of bacteria doubles. A simple way to calculate the number of bacteria expected after a certain generation time is to take the number two and raise it to the power of the number of generations that have passed. That should give you the total number of bacteria in the sample at that point. Now this number right here, 4.7 times 10 to the 21, that is a purely theoretical number. And when growing microbes in the lab, we would never see such a number of cells. The reason being that when we grow microbes in the lab, they are limited by the availability of nutrients that are present in their little environments that we provide to them. There's a finite amount of nutrients 
in an agar plate, for example, or a broth tube. And so when we grow microbes in the lab, they adhere to what we call a growth curve. A growth curve represents the number of bacteria that occur through different phases of the life cycle of that sample. There are four distinct phases in the growth curve. When we first inoculate a sample of bacteria into a fresh tube of growth media, they are said to be in the lag phase. During the lag phase, the population is level and it is low. At this point, the bacteria are simply preparing for their division and they have not yet begun to divide. The second phase is called the log phase. It's called the log phase because log is abbreviation for logarithmic, which is synonymous with exponential. It is during the log phase that we start to see the increasing growth at an increasing rate. So at this point, the bacteria are dividing furiously. They're cloning themselves over and over again and taking full advantage of the nutrition available in their environment. The third phase is called the stationary phase. At some point, the population of microbes reaches a point where it is now under strain with the available nutrients left in the environment. And in the stationary phase, what happens is while microbes are still dividing, the number of microbes that are dying is equal to the number of microbes that are now being created. And so the growth levels off again, the population is steady for a period of time, until eventually all of the nutrients in the environment have been depleted. And at this point, the microbes begin to die at a logarithmic rate. The fourth stage is therefore, therefore called the death phase because we see the population of microbes drop back down. In the final part of this lecture, we're going to take a look at some different methods for measuring microbial growth. You'll see in your textbook that there are a variety of methods for quantifying the number of cells in a culture. However, we are going to limit our scope and we are going to focus on two of the more common ones, which are plate counts using serial dilutions and a direct microscopic count. A plate count involves taking a sample of culture and spreading it on the surface of an agar plate and allowing it to incubate and grow. After a period of time, we would expect to see what we call colony forming units, or simply colonies, appear on the surface of the plate. Now each of these colonies does not represent a single bacterial cell. Rather, these represent clusters of hundreds of thousands of bacterial cells. But we can make the assumption that when the original culture was spread, each CFU is the result of where a single bacterium landed and over the course of incubation grew to this visible size. So in this way, we can count the number of colony forming units on the surface of the plate and use that to determine how many bacteria were originally in the culture. For example, if we look at this plate and we see that there are 67 colonies, we can assume that whatever volume of culture we spread on the surface of plate, there were 67 bacteria in that volume. The problem with the plate count is that bacteria are usually so highly concentrated that they will not differentiate into individual colonies. Instead, they grow in the form of what is called a lawn. A lawn occurs when there's so much bacteria at such a high concentration that it grows as just a continuous blob and you cannot distinguish individual colony forming units and therefore you can't quantify the amount of bacteria in the culture. The solution to this lawn problem is something called serial dilutions. What you can do is you can water down your microbial culture in a controlled way that allows you to get a lower concentration of bacteria in the culture, but still be able to do a calculation that reverse engineers the amount of bacteria in the original culture. For example, what a serial dilution typically looks like is taking 
one milliliter of the original culture and adding it to nine milliliters of fresh, clean, sterile broth media. When you mix this together, what you have is a one in 10 dilution. In other words, it should be 10 times more dilute or 10 times more watered down than the original culture. When you plate this on a plate and you look for the number of colonies, you can then say that you know that the original culture was 10 times more concentrated than whatever you created in this dilution. However, typically a single dilution is not enough. Usually multiple dilutions need to be performed in order to eventually achieve a plate that has a number of colonies that can be accurately counted. So every time you create a dilution by transferring one milliliter of broth and adding it to nine milliliters of fresh, clean, sterile media, you are uh, increasing the dilution factor by one tenth. So this first tube represents a one in 10 dilution. The second one represents a one in 100 dilution. The third one, a one in 1,000 dilution, one in 10,000, and one in 100,000. Eventually, you have watered your culture down enough to where you can accurately count the number of colonies, and then you can reverse engineer the amount of colonies or the concentration of bacteria in the original culture, which is as simple as taking the number of colonies and multiplying it by the dilution factor. For example, if we have three colonies, on the plate that is a one in 100,000 dilution, and we plated one milliliter of broth on that plate, then all we have to do is take three, multiply it by 100,000, and we can say that there are 300,000 bacteria per milliliter in the original culture. So I want you to try this out yourself. Let's say that the plate that you see on the screen here represents a 1 in 10,000 dilution of the original culture. Tell me how many bacteria are estimated to be in each milliliter of the original culture based on the number of colonies that you see on the screen right here. So to recap, what we've just discussed was called the plate count with serial dilutions. The second and last technique that we'll talk about for quantifying microbial concentrations is the direct microscopic count. The direct microscopic count is just what it sounds like. It uses a microscope in order to look directly at bacteria and determine how many are present in a certain volume of culture. This technique relies upon a special slide called the hemocytometer which has a microscopic grid that you can use under the microscope to help you distinguish between different bacterial cells and count, for example, how many bacteria are in one quadrant before moving on to another. Typically, a volume equal to 0.01 milliliters of culture is spread over the grid in the hemocytometer. And knowing that 0.01 milliliters is one hundredth of a milliliter, you can then reverse engineer and calculate the average number of bacteria per milliliter in the culture by taking the number that you get and multiplying it by 100. There are some disadvantage to, disadvantages to the direct microscopic count as compared to the standard plate count. One disadvantage is that if the organisms that you are looking at are motile, meaning if they are able to move, it makes it incredibly difficult to count them and make sure that you are not counting the same organism twice. In addition, under the microscope, many times dead bacteria look exactly like living bacteria. And so you are unable to distinguish between bacteria in the sample that have already died and bacteria that are still alive. This is not an issue with the plate count method because dead bacteria will not form a colony forming unit. Lastly, direct microscopic counts are vulnerable to something called sampling error. Sampling error describes what happens when the concentration in a culture is uneven. 
For example, maybe microbes have settled toward the bottom, but you take your 0 0.01 milliliter sample from the top or vice versa. So we have one final checkpoint here, which involves a calculation based upon the direct microscopic count method. Let's say you transfer several 0 0.01 milliliter samples of bacterial culture to hemocytometers and view them under the microscope, finding an average of 126 bacteria per sample. How many bacteria are there per milliliter in the original culture? And once you finish this checkpoint, you are finished with chapter nine.